everyone. Thank you again for being here tonight to enjoy La La Land with us. My name is Gretchen McCord. My name is Gretchen McCord, and um, here at ArcLight at our circuit, I oversee all of um, the film and the events. And I can tell you that the day I was in the office and I got the call that asked me if I wanted to play La La Land early on a limited break, and I wanted to have an event with a Q&A with the four people I'm going to introduce to you, it was a very easy day at the office <laughs> to say yes and yes. Um, so we have a big treat for you guys tonight. I want to introduce Jordan Horowitz. portrayed the way we did, um, so beautifully, comically, sadly. And so, Damien, I, I wanted you to talk about that a little bit. How did you decide on um, Los Angeles and, and the style, the color, the, the, the past, and the, and the current, it just the mm -hmm. mix that you brought it? Um, I mean, I, I think a lot of it was uh, kind of, you know, working through my own feelings about the city. I, I, I grew up on the East Coast, and um, like a lot of snooty East Coasters, you know, kind of LA seemed like this uh, this wasteland. <laughs> and uh, and then I moved here, and um, it wasn't just that I fell in love with you know the kind of gorgeous city that I think it actually is, but that everything that I think is normally something people sometimes criticize LA for when they're outside LA was something that I became really fascinated by. You know, you complain, you hear people complain about well, there's no city center, it's sprawling. Um, I became fascinated by the fact that actually that allows this incredible topography that makes it unlike any other city and has to do with the history and that, you know. Um, and I became obsessed with, you know, people say, oh, LA doesn't really have history. Well, as a movie lover, the history of LA is so inextricably tied with movie history, you know. And so I think I became really obsessed with that. And the idea of, oh, well, in LA, everyone has their head in the clouds. I wanted to kind of celebrate that as well, the idea of like a, a city where where dreams and reality kind of blend a bit and where people do, uh, you know, do pursue their dreams still. It still is a dream factory in many ways. And I think, um, you know, you can roll your eyes at that, but there's also something I think really poetic about it. Even if the dreams never come true, just the act of people going to a place to pursue them, I think, gives it a kind of incredible energy. So I just wanted to celebrate that. And so, um, Ryan and Jordan, this next question is for you. From the perspective of um, a producer and a big star, how, how, what, was, uh, what was the risk and the challenge of taking on a musical in 2016? Do you want me to take a big star? Take a big star, oh my god. So, Damien and I were introduced um, uh, about six years ago by a mutual friend, uh, me and another um, he sort of pitched uh, a romantic uh, musical set in Los Angeles um, with original songs written by his college roommate. Um, and we, of course, said, yeah, let's go make that movie. Um, and, you know, it was, it was this incredibly pure vision. And we sort of we signed up and we developed it for many years trying to get it made. And it was, um, it was a challenge because it was always a, it was always this very ambitious, very big version of this film. Um, and it took a lot of uh, a lot of luck and a lot of patience uh, to be able to mount the version that I think Damien was uh, holding his head from that very first meeting. Um, and then, you know, luckily we got uh, the cast we ultimately got. 
that replicating half of that cast, cast to be able to, to really go and, and, and make the version of the film that we want to make. But, but yeah, there was a lot of there was a lot of no, there was a lot of, of fear, a lot of questions um, about like how we were going to actually go out and do it, and why it came to the table ultimately, um, and really uh, really just allowed us to make a uh, version of the film that, that we'd always sort of dreamed of making. Um, but I'll, I'll let Ryan sort of take the other the other side. I actually met Damien uh, not about this film, but just uh, we, we, uh, we met at a bar near my house, and the later that I got, Damien got more and more passionate uh, uh, and animated about making movies that you didn't want to see on your iPhone, that you wanted to watch in a theater uh, with an audience. that you wanted to see with people and have that experience, and it just it was very infectious. And it wasn't until months later that I read the script for this that I thought, oh, he, really, he really has a good shot at doing that. So um, it, didn't, it felt like a, more than a risk, which I guess it was. It just felt like more like a, a real opportunity. And jumping into the musical was, was exciting for you. Well, I guess I thought that old Hollywood musicals were a thing of the past, and uh, it was just, it wasn't even something I was dreaming of making, because I didn't think that it would be made anymore. I just thought that that ship had sailed, so. Well, we got, well, we got Moana. It's <laughs> <laughs> an excellent point. <laughs> Justin, Damien, you, uh, you guys worked together a bit back, which uh, was uh, one of our favorites. <laughs> and you're very, uh, obviously, like, like Jordan said, have been friends for a long time, roommates in college, and you worked together on the film last year. But you have a very different style of the way you work together, where you bring, usually scoring, music comes in afterwards, it's layered on top, but you guys work very differently together, bringing Justin in from the beginning. Do you wanna talk a little bit about your process and how that came about? Yeah, uh, well, I'll pass it up then real quick. Just just, uh, just the quick context being that, yeah, at the, at the very, but the, the, so the four people at the outset of this, uh, at the very beginning, were, were Jordan, uh, uh, Jordan's uh, producing, um, uh, or, or other producer on this movie, Fred, and Justin. Um, and uh, yeah, Justin and I had met as musicians, actually. I mean, you know, we, we, were, we met in college, but I was drumming, he was playing piano, um, but we both kind of really bonded over movies and over this idea of, of putting sort of uh, lush, big, 90-piece orchestra sort of uh, sounds and music on the big screen, trying to make that feel like something that was still relevant, still timely. Um, and uh, yeah, so as soon as I started working on this, you, you were working on it. And yeah, we like to start really early. We like to know as early as possible what the music or some of the musical ideas are going to be. Um, Themes are really important to us, melodies are really important to us. Obviously for a musical it's particularly important, you need to have a lot of music figured out before the movie's shot, but I think any movie we do, we're gonna to wanna to know, and we approach it the same way in Whiplash with the, the score theme and whatnot. You know, I think we wanna know what the main sort of themes are gonna be, um, to have those in mind, uh, you know, when the movie's being made. I think Damien likes that. Also just, I need the time to be able to come up with something that's good enough. Um, and it can take a very, very, very long time to, to find the right material. I did a little over 1,900 piano demos in this movie. Before we got, before I got to arranging vocals or orchestrating, it was just at the piano, finding the themes and the melodies, going down a lot of different roads. Um, so that can take a very long time, and Damien can be very, very demanding and, and say no to a lot of things, but it's for the best because, you know, he keeps pushing me until he has the, until I have sort of the, the melodies that he believes in and we believe that are really going to stick with people. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to get boxed in and have, you know, like, pictures locked and I have four weeks until the score has to be recorded. We need the time where I, where I can just throw out, just try idea after idea and throw them out and, and we can just keep searching for it. Coming out from a producer's place, I mean, their process was, we were developing it, 
the, the music and the, the strip simultaneously. And I, I don't think there's a world where anyone would have even understood what we were trying to do if we didn't have this holistic package that we were able to kind of show people as we started introducing the project to, um, uh, to, to the town. Um, but, but this process was, you know, from the very start, it was really clear that, that they were sort of feeding off of each other and, and developing the music while the script, and the script would change, and the music would change. And it was, um, it was yeah, holistic, I think, is the word. And from the beginning, um, obviously, in a musical, the numbers are, are there and important, but the score behind that and underneath you know, the dialogue, was that always, I mean, it's almost a character unto itself. Was that there from the beginning? Yeah, uh, well, some of the score we figured out during pre-production, like there are large sections of the movie, uh, you know, like in the planetarium and some of the ending sequence where we wanted to have a lot of that kind of uh, sort of created, mocked up to some degree, so that Damien would know what he was shooting to, um, and sort of what that sequence would feel like and how it would be shot. But then, you know, he and Damien and the picture editor recut those sequences, so I had to then kind of reconfigure, recompose, reorchestrate a lot of it to picture, which is just what a film composer does. Uh, and then there's just the whole dramatic. I mean, that that's that score, but then you have so many other scenes that there was no score figured out before. That's you just respond to what's on the screen. So I'm watching, I'm watching scenes, and I'm responding to, uh, you know, the performances and the way they're cutting it and the the colors on the screen. And that's that's sort of what a film composer normally does. We it was a little unusual in this situation in the sense that. I started at the very beginning of the editorial process, um, so I was scoring for about eight months um, while Damien and Tom were cutting the movie. Uh, I had an office next to the editing room, so I, I wasn't waiting for a locked picture. Just for those eight months back and forth, they were giving me scenes, I was giving them cues, and the, the picture and the score were kind of evolving together. So they were reconfiguring some scenes based on the score cue, and I was obviously scoring based on the picture, and the, the picture and music were sort of um, informing each other. So Ryan, there's a rumor out there being started, I think, by John Legend that you are really a child musical prodigy. And this whole story that you learned to play uh, jazz piano this year is not true. Um, so how important was it for you, to, you, you did learn to play the piano and, and play the piano in all of those scenes himself, uh, but how important was that for you to <laughs> for the, the singing, the dancing, and the piano playing to, to be all of you? Well, um, Damien wanted to shoot all these things in one shot, so I really didn't have a damn choice. <laughs> <laughs> there was no room to, uh, to cut in a, a, a real piano player. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, I, I've always wanted to play, and it just was an opportunity to finally sit down and apply myself. And, uh, and plus, the music is so beautiful. I just, I really uh, wanted to learn it, and I enjoyed playing it. I still play it. I should be sick of it, but I'm not. It's a testament to how strong the music is, too. And were you a jazz fan before this? Or were you a more classical piano? What were you looking to play? Well, I just wanted to play along with something. You know, I, 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 I guess I thought I liked jazz, but I really knew very little about it. The whole process of making this film and working with these wonderful jazz musicians and watching their process and listening to them play. I had a wonderful piano tutor. Um, there's also a great documentary by Ken Burns uh, about jazz for PBS, which <laughs> I watched the whole time making the film. It was very inspiring, great, great piece of work as well. Well, there's so many amazing scenes on screen. I'm curious to what didn't make the cut. Uh, we were talking a little bit before we came out about some uh, 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 scenes that almost didn't make it. So how, how, what was that process of deciding what made it on screen, what didn't, how much is, uh, is, is not, are we not seeing? Uh, I guess, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, with, I, I guess as with every movie, there's, uh, stuff that's on the cutting room floor, sometimes stuff that I, I really liked, you know, and um, uh, the, but, but uh, yeah, during the course of editing, um, there was a lot of, 
I guess, experimentation, though it seemed more kind of, you know, even more definitive when we were doing it, of just trying to, I look back, I think of it as we were trying to sort of see what the, what the movie needed, what the movie would fail without, especially when it came to some of the musical numbers. Um, you know, uh, and so uh, you might be referring to, yeah, for about, you know, three, four months of the editing process, we um, had decided to cut the opening, you know, the whole opening sequence uh, on the freeway. Um, and, and that was because, you know, it just didn't seem to really be, uh, th there were other elements around it that turned out to be the problem, but that were kind of all compounding. Um, uh, uh, and so it, it sort of seemed like it needed to be taken out. We realized actually after we took it out that other problems arose and that, you know, we wanted putting it back in and cutting other things around it. Um, there used to be a whole big, beautiful uh, overture that um, Justin wrote um, that uh, an orchestrated um, set to, you know, sort of painted opening credits, um, um, which that was in the first pages of the script. I always thought part of the reason, there were like three reasons for me to do the movie. It was like, um, it was to, in terms of the sequences in the film, it was the ending. It was the sort of floating up in the planetarium in the middle, and it was this not the opening traffic number, it was the opening overture. Because um, you don't have big, full-fledged opening overtures with painted backdrops and all that stuff anymore. So um, there I felt really like a chump for when, when we had to cut that. Um, but yeah, stuff just winds up on the cutting room floor, and you kind of you, you, you learn as you go. Um, I'm thankful at least that no musical numbers wound up actually on the cutting room floor. No, but we cut about half of the second song, Someone in the Crowd, because we found we were kind of losing Mia's thread for it. It was following those three roommates for much longer, um, and we were sort of losing the, the sort of emotional through line for Mia. Yeah, we had a big choreographed uh, sort of piece in the street with uh, the three, Sonia, um, Callie and, um, uh, and Jessica and, and uh, those three actresses. So that, yeah, that was an example of something where that was a day of shooting that, uh, you know, didn't make it in. You always try, I always feel again like I'm always kind of, I try at the outset before every, I did this on Whiplash too, trying to figure out before you start shooting what, I only want to be shooting exactly the bare minimum of what I, you know, think I'm going to need because otherwise you feel like you're wasting time. And you always invariably wind up shooting a lot more than you wind up using in the movie. Um, but I guess I've come to think of it as less actually wasting time the way it might seem practically and more, you know, it's actually good maybe to sort of live in scenes that even if they're not in the movie or for the actors to live in scenes that maybe don't wind up in the movie or all of us to kind of, it's, it's probably actually part of the process of making it and probably informs the other scenes even if you don't wind up using them at the end. Uh, you mentioned it and I, I had it as a question, that ending. So what, uh, what's the reaction been from the ending and, and what did, Ryan, what did you think about it when you first read the script? Because it's not that, you know, all tied up with a bow, pretty little Hollywood ending. Um, I think the man really knows how to end a movie. <laughs> <laughs> he really does. And uh, it was always something that I think uh, every time you read it, it's just, it got you and every time you see it, it does too, you know, it's, uh, it was what we were uh, well, working towards to sort of earn that ending. That was the challenge. What's your the reaction been to you? Have you, I mean, have you heard a lot about the ending uh, not being uh, what people would expect? Yeah, I, mean, I think in some ways it's a, uh, in a weird way, this is almost what I wanted. I mean, there's the, it's a testament to Ryan and Emma, I think, that um, some people are, are quite angry with me that, <laughs> that they're not <laughs> together at the end. Um, and, uh, uh, but in a way, I guess that's, that's a sign that people, you know, want your characters to be together. I think there's, uh, no, but I think for the most part, you know, there's, there's, uh, um, I, I always thought of it as not a sad ending, and I think when we were pitching the movie to financiers, and especially Jordan and myself, uh, we would get these sort of quizzical, you know, kind of looks and, um, and, uh, Expressions. I mean, it's you know, it was bad enough that we were trying to convince people to do like a jazz original musical with like <laughs> me, you know, and my college roommate doing like the directing, the writing, the music. I don't think they should end up together. <laughs> like, like, compounding that with you know, oh, it's a really romantic love story where they don't wind up together. It just didn't. I tried to like tell people, you know, no, really, like it's even. I tried to. Sp sp I almost tried to like do the commercial game too, where you beat them at their own game. You say, like, well, if you look at the comps, like 
I'd use the notebook. <laughs> I'd use, uh, use Casablanca, Gone with the Wind, Titanic, uh, Romeo and Juliet, if you can kind of count that. Um, I, thought, I thought Love Story, The Way We Were, I thought I was just making such a great argument. It just didn't click with people, so <laughs> whatever. Um, but we were thankful that Lionsgate eventually just, yeah, um, they, they were the one place that was kind of like, okay, you guys, you know, keep it original music and keep them a part at the end, and uh, we'll support you. That's great. Um, we talk all the time about movies you know, being a, a great place to escape, and, and especially uh, when things are tough in the real world. And there's something, there's something, there's a different level that you reached here where we're not. It's not just escapism. It's it's. Uh, I felt like we walked in Sebastian and, and Mia's shoes. And was that how? How did you reach that that different level where it wasn't just we were watching something else happen and saying, "Oh, that's a nice world for two hours. We're we're out of our own." But we were we were there with you guys. It, it was it was the emotion. I think is what everybody's feeling. We heard it here, gasping and laughing and and clapping, almost like they were at live theater. Well, I think obviously movies can. Uh, be a great uh, way to escape, but it seems to be, I think it's a lot that there was a theme in the movie that you don't want to escape, which is the importance of pursuing your dreams despite the obstacles. So it feels like there was a, you were, you were able to escape, but also you know, you're kind of uh, you know, being reminded of the uh, importance of that. It's not the best answer I've ever seen. He just like looked at me. Yeah, he was like, "Help me." He's passing that. Right he saw that. No, I mean, yeah, I, I agree. I guess, I, um, I guess the only thing, yeah, I would say also, yeah, is, is uh, um, I think a lot of the the musicals that you know Ryan and I loved and that all of us loved were, um, uh, yeah, obviously movies that provide. Hope and joy and optimism, but but do it by actually acknowledging that life isn't always, you know. I think you think of something like maybe in St. Louis or The Umbrellas of Cherbourg or, or um, um, some of those great musicals that are kind of more about ordinary life to me, you know. Um, they they acknowledge that ordinary, ordinary life has its ups and downs um, and that you don't always get every single thing. Um, so I I, um, I guess it's another reason why, yeah, again, I thought of this as. as not a sad ending, and I thought of it, and I, but at the same time, I don't think of it as purely escapist as a movie. I think of it as, you know, hopefully, hopefully something where it's more like kind of putting on glasses to see the world, you know, in, 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 you know, a slightly different perspective, which I guess is what any movies, uh, you know, can do no matter what the tone. But I think musicals present a certain vision of the world that um, is just particular, and that I think we wanted to try to try to update and and and, and communicate. Um. And for, for almost all, for all of you, and, and Jordan and I was thinking of you particularly with this question, is, I mean, this movie was obviously made for a cinematic experience and to be shown in a theater and that experience. But as, um, as there's so many outlets now, so I, I feel like the, it's, you know, the creative community is just you know, growing and by, because of what's on uh, network television, what's you know, on streaming and subscription, what's in theaters. Do you do you think of that end, you know, for your projects and for your whatever you're working on when you first start? I and mean, this is obviously a little bit different because it is made, you know, a big musical made for the cinema. But when you first look at scripts, when you first start writing, do you have that end place in mind? Uh, I can start. Yeah, um, for, for me as a as a producer, and I work in, in television and in the future, so. 100%. Even in features, you know, a lot of the smaller movies, um, I sort of I know that they're going to wind up either with any day release. And I, I, I think the most important thing is, for me, with, with other filmmakers I work with, is just setting expectations for what the world is right now and being really realistic about, um, about like, like the positives of, of not necessarily this like big broad theatrical release. I think that there's a lot of positives to go in different routes, and you just need to you need to understand what the end game of your uh, of your work is. And there's um, there are a lot of viable end games for your work. Uh, it just depends on um, the size of the work and, and the intention of the work. But uh, but yeah, I, I definitely have that conversation very clearly with 
um, and any other writers and or filmmakers that I work with about the, the realities of the current landscape because um, it's really important because setting proper expectations informs the work and, and the process as you do it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I mean, I was, I'm just, it's funny answering that question sitting here, because I was like, <laughs> the, like, the end for me was showing at the Cinerama Dome, <laughs> basically, you know, um, or beyond that, showing at, you know, not just, uh, in a way, not just movie theaters, but there's something to think about a theater like this, or a theater like, we were also lucky enough, I think, at, um, um, uh, we were lucky enough recently to be at, at um, Grauman's, or the, the Chinese theater, you know, theaters, the way we used to think of theaters um, um, as, as, you know, kind of the movie palace idea, which doesn't really exist anymore, except with some of those theaters that, you know, we're lucky enough in LA to actually have a fair number of them still uh, looking beautiful and playing movies in a beautiful way. Um, the El Capitan um, Exactly. Yeah. Uh, where you can see Moana. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so it's like, you know, that, that, that tr trying to make a movie uh, for that experience, you know, the, the, um, uh, I, I remember Justin and I, when we were prepping this movie, at some point we went to this theater for a retrospective of Lawrence of Arabia, um, and, you know, just, I don't know, just that the, the feeling of hearing, like, the opening bass drums kind of rumbling as the logos come up and the overture comes up, or feeling just the width of the frame. Um, it's, uh, again, you get it in any movie theater, and to a certain extent, you get it on any size screen. It's, it's, the image itself isn't changed, but just that kind of feeling um, that, you know, used to be part of the course in like the, you know, through the 50s and 60s and the road show kind of idea um, um, was something that I, I kind of wanted yeah, to try to really try about that. Wanted to try to study it. It was always, uh, it was always very cinematic. It was made for almost to be an end in a way, but. And that was, that was the expectation that we had going into it, but, you know. There, there, wasn't, there wasn't always shared by the people we were <laughs> pitching to. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you know, you try to, yeah, you try to aim high and try to, uh, yeah. So that was kind of the hope. Well, I'm sorry we're out of time already tonight, but again, um, I don't know, you guys will see them everywhere the next, but how busy all of um, these guys are, everybody attached to the film, and just how generous they're being with their time to be with us tonight. And they're here all weekend for different screenings. Emma's joining on Sunday, but thank you, thank you for doing this. It really means